the reason Paul, first of all, that Paul wrote First Thessalonians was that there were uh, people in the church, their their loved ones have have died. And so Paul, and they're, they're, they had a question about, are they going to reunite with them at the Parsia? And so Paul writes back to reassure them that they are going to re reunite with their loved ones at the Parsia. And then a few months later, Paul gets word back saying, there's another defective eschatology. We have another problem in the Thessalonian church. They're experiencing this persecution, and now they themselves think they're going to, they've missed the Parsia. That is the right. day of the Lord. And so Paul writes back and say, you know, he says, of course, don't be quickly shaken from your composure. Don't be disturbed either by spirit or a message or a, or a letter as if from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Because they're they're confusing persecution with God's punishment. Right. Because they're thinking, wait, this must be the day of the Lord that Paul talked about. And we're experiencing, we missed the Lord's coming. And Paul writes back and says, no. That, that's that's persecution. That's not the day of the Lord. In fact, right, right. And he and he gives a conditional statement. He says that two events. He says, uh, you know, unless uh, in verse three he says, let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come. That is the day of the Lord, unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is re revealed, the son of destruction. So two events: the apostasy and the revelation of man of law lawlessness will happen first. Protos, that's a key term there, the adverb there, mm -hmm. protos, first. So that has to happen be first, then the day of the Lord will arrive. And what's ironic here is that many pre-tribulationists, I believe, will be, the, well, in their theology, they confuse persecution with the day of the Lord. They conflate the con great tribulation with the day of the Lord's wrath. Rather, the great tribulation period is not God's wrath. And I'm afraid mm -hmm. that, you know, if, if the, or when the Antichrist arrives, that many of our preacher brothers and sisters in the Lord are going to confuse the persecution of the Antichrist, thinking that this is God's wrath. We are told we we're supposed to be out of here. They're going to commit the same Thessalonian air right. as these uh, beloved did in the first century. So Paul is writing back saying, no, uh, the day of the Lord, the day of Christ, it will not arrive until it's a conditional. Paul is using a conditional right. statement here. And so two events and not just Paul isn't just using a conditional statement here, but he's actually reinforcing it by adding a the adverb protos first. He says this has to happen right. first. So he doesn't <laughs> right, have to right. add that adverb, but he, he adds his adverb to reinforce what he's saying that, look, you have to see these two events first. You're going to experience these events first, and then the day of the Lord will come afterwards. There is this idea out here, though, that when when it talks about the great falling away, um, the, the apostasia, um, that it's not talking about a falling away, but rather it's talking about specifically a departure. And uh, there's a couple people out there who are using this term apostasia being used as departure to reference the rapture. So in that sense, the eminency is maintained because the apostasia is now part of the initial things that happen or the departure or the rapture, uh, as some would say. What, what would you say to that? I mean, I mean, to me, to me, right off the bat, it, it really sounds like Paul is saying the rapture is not going to happen until the rapture happens. <laughs> that, that's, that's what it sounds yeah. like. But, but is, there, is there any more to say on that? Yeah, I mean, the, the term apostasy or the, the apostasy, uh, the Greek term here is apostasia, and it's a noun. In Koine literature, there's not a single instance in all of Koine literature where this noun ever means a physical departure. Because a lot of pre-tribulationists will say, yeah, it means a physical departure, meaning the rapture. It never means this in a single instance in all of Koine literature. Uh, it always refers to a like a political or religious departure. And that's what it means here. I debated Thomas Ice on this very question in mm -hmm. uh, 1995. And in the cross-examination, I, I pressed him. I said, can you, in this debate tonight, can you provide a single instance, a, a one document anywhere in Koine literature that this Greek term ever means a physical departure? And he said, no. Now, he's one of the leading exponents of this view. And okay. so he, he'll try to argue it for, you know, through different arguments. But you can you can watch this on YouTube and you can see the cross-examination. He, he right. admits he cannot. So you, you have to really question more of a desperate, a desperate attempt, I believe, to get this to mean the rapture. But like you said, it even if you make this rapture, it doesn't make any sense because it's like saying the rapture can't come until the rapture comes first. It's recursion. I have a software development background. That's how recursion works, right? Okay. 
<laughs> yeah. uh, those software developers who are watching don't understand <laughs> that. I get a good laugh. We we have absolutely have to devote a second episode to this, but can you just touch really briefly on the mark of the beast, 666 versus 616? Let's just kind of whet the appetite for a future episode. Sure. Uh actually, yeah, that's <clears throat> it's funny because I was thinking about de- textual variants that are related to eschatology. I was thinking of one in Revelation 4, 5. And, uh, but yeah, that, that, that's another one as well. There's good evidence that it is 616. And there's some evidence on the other hand as well. So, and it's something I want to explore further. And maybe perhaps once I do, I, I'm actually writing a commentary on the book of Revelation at revelationcommentary.com. So once I get to that, t- and it's, uh, it's going to have a, a, a pretty significant textual critical component to this commentary. It's a scholarly commentary. And so I'm going to be engaging these issues. And so I want to research that textual variant more in depth before I kind of come to any conclusions on that one. Um, how, how far along are you on it? I, I'm just starting. I'm just actually doing it. I'm oh, okay. Okay. I'm preparing research right now <laughs> for it. Yeah. Uh, but it's, I project it's going to be a six to eight year project and okay, okay. probably about maybe three to 400,000 words. So it's going to be, it's definitely going to be a scholarly commentary and, and it, from a, of course a, yeah. So it, I'm going to be engaging a lot of literature uh, in that commentary. I, again, I think we've talked, we've mentioned this book once before here, um, but I want to just kind of talk a little bit about the two sort of main uh, presuppositions that you're talking about. So this, so this, this book specifically answers to two kind of general ideas ideas that come out from a preach review one is that the parousia or the second coming uh, is distinct and different uh, from the rapture. They're two separate events and they're treated separately. They happen, happen at different times. Um, and then the other one is that the, that God does not work with Israel and the church during the age of grace. And I don't think you said age of grace, but I'm just using that as, as the general church age. So once the church starts, the church goes until the church age is over and then God continues his program with Israel. I didn't know that was a thing. <laughs> I really didn't know that. Maybe that's really into the weeds of dispensationalism. Now, I, I would consider myself a dispensationalist, but the idea of Israel not being worked with at the same time as the church just doesn't seem very, um, just doesn't seem to align with reality. Can you can you touch on that? So they would view Daniel chapter nine and Daniel's future 70 week uh, prophecy as it's a fundamental proof text. Uh, so in other words, the church cannot, ex- they would say, well, that was made to Israel. That was a prophecy made to Israel. Therefore, the church cannot exist on earth during this time. When the uh, the first 69 weeks, they would say, when that was, the, uh, the church didn't exist during the first 69 weeks, they would argue. Therefore, the church can't exist during the seventh week of, of Daniel, uh, which doesn't make any sense because, well, the church now exists. The church didn't exist for the the first part of Daniel's 70th week prophecy, not to mention you have prophecies actually given in the Old Testament, like, you know, Joel 2 prophecy and the New Covenant prophecy and so forth. It was given to Israel, but we know those were fulfilled during the church age, especially at the beginning of the church age. And of course, Jesus makes a prophecy to Israel. They're going to be judged. That happened in AD 70 during the church age. Ezekiel's prophecy of the dry bones, yeah, uh, Israel yeah. became a nation in 1948 during the church age. So this argument that, well, Daniel's prophecy that was made to Israel, therefore the church can't be around, uh, just doesn't make sense. And it's not consistent uh, with these other prophecies. Right. So how how does a pre, I don't understand how a pre-tribulation rapture hinges on that. What is it about pre-tribulationism that requires God to wait for him to finish working with the church bef- before he begins to work with Israel. I'm talking more about the traditional dispensationists. Uh, maybe the more right. progressive dispensationists today would not make that argument. They would try to make an argument for pre-tribulationists on other grounds. But to answer your question, is a, because I, it's this idea of the uh, their dispensational system in which they have a very rigid where when dispensations change, they have to change absolutely, as if God can't work with Israel and the church at the same time. Right. Uh, it doesn't make any sense. Not to mention that Paul says that God is saving Gentiles to make Israel jealous <laughs> right, right now. Right, right. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, so, I guess that, so that is in a sense working with Israel, isn't it? I never thought of that. And so when they come to the 70th week of Daniel, they identify the entire seven-year period as 
God's wrath. And so they would say that since we're promised exemption from the day of the Lord's wrath, mm -hmm. the rapture has to happen before uh, the seventh week of Daniel begins. And, and another reason why they would say, again, the church must be raptured before the seventh week of Daniel begins is once again, because God, the seventh week of Daniel, they would say, this is, this, that's a, that's a, that's Israel's week. That's right. part of Daniel's prophecy. Uh, but that's a, that's a flawed understanding of Daniel's seventh week. And, and in my book, pre trib I, I, I give, I, half the book is devoted to this one <coughs> foundational belief uh, in that somehow that God doesn't work with Israel and the church at the same time. He right. certainly does. Yeah. So that kind of leads into the next, uh, the next sort of thing here is when we talk about the day of the Lord, you're referencing Daniel's 70th week there. And then pre-trib typically seizes the whole week as the day, uh, the day of the Lord. Um, but when, when does the day of the Lord start and how long is the day of the Lord? I guess how, how long is the day of the Lord is kind of like the real banger of a question, right? Uh, how, how long is that? When does it start and how long is it? The day of the Lord is a, it's an extended event. The Parsia, second coming day of the Lord, this is all an extended event. When Jesus returns, he's coming as deliverer, judge, and king. And so the day of the Lord, Parsia, this is the second coming. This, this will extend all the way through the millennium because the term Parsia, it, it means presence and a continuing presence. And so his second coming isn't going to stop at Armageddon is going to extend through the millennium. That, In fact, that's the very reason right. why he's returning is to establish his kingdom. I like to use this analogy when we talk about the future second coming of Christ. When we think of the first coming of Christ, we think of his his birth, right? It's not, it, his birth wasn't encompassed, encompassed his entire first coming. It was, it was a, it was a arrival in a continuing presence. It was his birth growing up, his uh, calling his disciples, his miracles, his deeds, uh, his death, burial, resurrection, and even his ascension. That was all mm -hmm. his first coming. Likewise, it's going to be the same with the second coming of Christ. The second coming, the parsi of Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, is the rapture and the resurrection that initiates the second coming of Christ. <laughs> And so you have the second coming of Christ. It's not going to be some instantaneous moment. The rapture and the second coming is not identified with each other like post-tribs and pre-tribs and like to disconnect the rapture from the second coming of Christ. Rather, the rapture belongs to the second coming of Christ and it initiates the second coming of Christ. It's an extended event in which God will fulfill many divine purposes through his son. Why Why is this such an important discussion, right? We oftentimes hear like um, eschatology, it's just kind of one of those things that are nebulous and a bunch of Christians disagree and it's not like a major and, and you know, we don't we don't uh, separate for these things, which I, I mean, I, I would say that's kind of true. Um, but what, what makes eschatology and specifically pre-wrath so important to be talking about? What, what's, what's important about it? I think that we we look at the warnings from in the New Testament, and we believe that these are meaningful warnings. Jesus Jesus was not a disingenuous prophet. For example, Matthew twenty four verse twenty five, he says, "Remember, I have told you these things ahead of time." Jesus doesn't just say, "Remember, I have told you these things," but he says, "Remember, I have told you these things ahead of time." What does that mean? It means that when these events start to happen, it's going to be too late to get your spiritual house in order. Just like the five right. foolish virgins. Five foolish virgins thought they could get their spiritual house in order right away. It's not the case. We're not going to, during the Great Tribulation, you're not going to have, we're not going to be having Bible prophecy conferences and, oh, you know what? Uh, let's teach the body of Christ now what really is supposed to happen. No, that's not going to happen. That's why he says ahead of time. And Paul says, let no one in any way deceive you for the day of the Lord or day of Christ uh, will not come in unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness, the son of destruction. So, and of course we know in, in, in the, first couple of verses in the in the book of Revelation, uh, warn us to understand these things that are about to happen. The most explicit graphic passage in, in the Bible of hell found in Revelation 14 is directly in the context of the mark of the beast. Many pre-tribulationists, and it's my prayer that they'll change their mind on this, they look at that passage and say, nah, that's that's not for me. That That's for quote-unquote tribulation saints. This is huge implications, ramifications, how one understands whether this applies to the church or not. And so for that reason, 
we take the warnings of Christ meaningfully because we believe that the last generation of the church will face persecution of the Antichrist, and we want the body of Christ to be victorious over the Antichrist by not giving, there's going to be a lot of temptations to give our allegiance to Antichrist, mm, but right. we got to stay faithful and keep our allegiance to Christ no matter what the cost. Right, right. And I guess that's that's sort of the, the danger, isn't it? It's like if we if we think that we are going to escape the tribulation, if we think that we're going to escape all of this crazy persecution that we're reading about in the first six chapters of Revelation, and then it comes upon us, and where it turns out we're not being raptured out before then, then, I mean, how many people are going to lose heart with that? How many people will lose faith, right? I, I think it's um, better to be prepared that... Histor I mean, historically, the church went through persecution. Uh, it's not it's not a foreign concept to the church. Maybe to us North Americans, the persecution the church is is foreign. But even now, you got places like China where you know Christians are literally being martyred for their faith. So it's it's not a foreign concept, at least around the world, for Christians to go through persecution. We take that and to see that there is persecution coming up in Revelation before the rapture occurs. It, it's a total, total possibility. I, and, and I mean, it would do well for our souls even now if we were to consider the possibility that we could go through persecution. And then, uh, of course, another thought that I have towards that end is is uh, we often talk about imminence. Now, pre-imminence in, in the pre-wrath rapture is just not a thing. Like the, there is no there is no imminence, imminence. We're waiting for the sign of the Antichrist to come. But then there's also a sense of imminence in that your personal rapture could happen tomorrow. You could cross the road and, and you know, you, the bus comes, right? And you're, you're not waiting. <laughs> Waiting for it. And there's your personal rapture. You've just been raptured up to the presence of the Lord. Um, so yeah, I think I think there's definitely places to be concerned with imminence and being ready and having your lamps full, if I want to use the esch eschatological terminology. But at the end of the day, we don't know when our hour comes. And so it's good to be ready always. So be ready always, but also be ready for persecution. I guess that's a long-winded way of kind of uh, working through mm -hmm. that. What say you? Well, I would say that we, we believe that Prerath believes that Jesus can return in any generation. And I think that's how Jesus designed the Olive Discourse was that if you become slothful during a time in your se uh, a season in your life, that's when Jesus can return. That's why he warns uh, that you have the analogy of the, the master, you know, saying, well, or the servant saying, you know, my master is is not returning for a long time. And, and you become complacent. We don't know if you're the last generation. And those who think, well, people, you know, if, if the pre-wrath is accused by saying, well, you, you don't believe in imminence, so how can you be vigilant? Because Jesus warns that if we become complacent in our at a season in our life, that's when Jesus can return. Because once again, he says, Matthew 24, 25, remember, I have told you this ahead of time. In other words, when they these events become, if you're tied up in the, the worries of this life, the slothfulness, and when these events um, happen, you're not going to have time and be in a place to get your spiritual house in order. Right. Uh, and and so it's um, the fact that, that he can return in, in any generation should uh, spur us to holy living. Right. And, and the, the idea of imminence, once again, you don't have to have, like I said, you, you can have death. Death is imminent. We don't know what tomorrow holds but the uh, scripture never talks about to to be ready you know that he can come at any moment now some people might say you know matthew 24 36 you don't know the day of the hour yeah but that's in right. the context of coming after the great tribulation that's that right. that passage is speaking uh so jesus gives what's going to happen and then beginning in verse like 40 or 42 right and, right you know live in light of of this because during the great tribulation during the great tribulation it is imminent we don't know if those days are going to be cut short at a day or hour that's when it becomes imminent right. is during the great tribulation that, and that that makes sense that's when the apostasy comes right uh when the great falling away happens and and uh i'm not sure how that'll look i suppose that's a really good um thought experiment to consider for an, another episode um mm -hmm. but uh, that your your discussion there does segue really well into a, a, an interesting question uh, so back when I was in the very early days of my Christian walk, I was totally pre-trib, totally like, you know, on board with the left behind kind of style of things, read all the books, right? Yes, I read all the books. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, so... 
the idea that you could be left behind that you know your your walk with the lord somehow has some sort of deficiency in it and then when christ returns he says no i'm leaving you because i just don't like the way you've been acting who who's going uh, when the rapture happens, who who's going? Is there anyone that's going to be left behind? What are the prerequisites to get in? Like, you know, how do we become part of the rapture? Are there going to be Christians who are left behind? I guess that's the the big question. Yeah, no, no, I I I, <clears throat> I don't believe so. In fact, I, I in Matthew twenty four, I think the key verse is Matthew twenty four verse thirty one. Uh, let me just turn there real quick here. Uh, Matthew twenty four thirty one. Well, after that, he talks about one. One is going to be taken and the other left. I actually think it's going to be the elect who are taken because it actually says it. In verse 31, he says, and he will send his angels with a loud trumpet blast and they will gather his elect from the four winds from the one end of earth or uh, of heaven to the other. Hmm. Uh, it's going to be the church. It's going to be all of God's people are going to be taken at the rapture. Those who are going to be left are going to be the wicked, the unrighteous. There is going to be uh, 144,000 to talk about from, from different tribes of, of Israel yeah. who are going to be sealed. They're going to be, but they're, it says they're going to be on earth, but they're protected. And I don't believe they're actually believers at that moment. I, I think they're going to be the first fruits of that remnant of Israel who, who at mm -hmm. the end of the seventh week of Daniel, they're going to recognize the Messiah for who he is. And they're going to make up, as I said, the first fruits of the salvation of Israel. So to answer your question, I think, well, we have to be right with God. We have to uh, understand yeah, yeah. that to be raptured, to be with the Lord, right? We want to be with the Lord and we have to uh, repent and believe in, in Jesus and what he did for us on the cross. Otherwise, you know, this is all speculation if we're not right with God. Yeah. So so basically what you're saying there is to, to just to use some Calvinistic lingo, if you're regenerated, um, then you're going in the rapture. Like there's, there's there's no question. There's no measuring that your life is more sanctified than your brother's life over here. You're just you're just it. The idea of tribulation saints doesn't really work out in the pre wrath view. Right. We will meet Christ in the clouds <clears throat> and he will usher us before the, the throne of the Father. So again, I just want to plug a couple books here from Dr. Kirshner. Um, this uh, pre-trib, Examining the Foundation of Pre-Tribulation Rapture Theology. Again, a very excellent read. It's down to earth. If you are not like scholarly minded and all that kind of stuff, you will still understand it. And then if you are interested in the pre-wrath position, uh, he's got a second book here just simply called Pre-Wrath, A Very Short Introduction. It is a very short introduction. I think it's like uh, 80 or 90 pages you could probably sit through it in one read like and, and it'll give you a really good overview of where pre-wrath differentiates between pre-trib and some of the other eschatological man one of these days i'm going to get that word right <laughs> eschatological uh, position anyway dr kirshner thank you so much for spending some time with me on the channel here and uh, i look forward to having you on in the future to talk about uh, a couple other things thank you for having me on Dwayne. appreciate it all right brothers and sisters anyway i hope you found this insightful and helpful and until next time we'll see you around